Hi, my name is Doug Lip, and you're listening to Leadership Biz Cafe. Hi, everyone. This is Tanvi Nasir. And on today's episode of Leadership Biz Cafe, I'll be talking with Doug Lip. Doug began his career at Disney as one of the trainers at the Disney University at Disneyland. He later served on the Walt Disney Imagineering team that was behind the creation of Tokyo Disneyland, where he also helped to create the first international version of the Disney University. Doug then went on to lead the training team at the corporate headquarters of the Walt Disney Company, the Walt Disney Studios. Since then, Doug has become an international keynote speaker and consultant on leadership, change, creativity, and global competitiveness. Doug is also the author of eight books on leadership, customer service, and international business, including his most recent, Disney U, How Disney University Develops the World's Most Engaged, Loyal, and Customer-Centric Employees, which will serve as the focus for today's conversation. Hi, Doug. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Tanvir. Pleased to be here today. Now, Doug, you and I have had the opportunity to meet in person a few months back, and we discussed some of the insights and experiences you share in your book about Disney University. And one thing I remember you talking about was how the heart of this book is the legacy of Van France, and in particular how he helped to define the four circumstances that to this day serve as the compass and guide for how Disney continues to create that empowered engaged workforce in their organization. So to help frame our discussion, could you share a little bit about Van and his four organizational values that drive Disney University? Yeah, well, certainly. Well, Tanvir, Van was hired by Walt Disney to help create the happiest place on earth, which is a phrase that many people know these days. But at the time, back in 1954, so this is about a year before Disneyland opened, Walt had invested millions of his own dollars in the infrastructure, the rides, the buildings, the restaurants of this new place called Disneyland, but he still needed to populate it with employees who were going to eventually be meeting the customers that Disney, of course, calls guests. So he approached Van, who at the time was in his mid-40s, had a long history of working in factories and industrial environments, and he said, hey, Van, we've invested all this money. Uh, You want to join me and help me create the happiest place on earth? And taking that into this this amazing journey of Disney University, Van started the very first orientation program at Disneyland in, in early 1955, getting ready for the opening of Disney in the summer of 55. And he took this whole concept of it's more than just an amusement park, it's a theme park, and how do we turn these 16 to 22 year old kids into ambassadors of friendliness? So it was really Van's brilliance to take Walt's essential core values and turn those into something that your your basic man or woman on the street would understand and he, he formulated the, the new vocabulary that was based on show business, and he formulated all of these amazing concepts that, to this day, Tanvir, are actually the, the foundation for not only the Disney University at all the Disney resorts and theme parks, but also, starting in the mid-1980s, turned into a tremendous business, an offshoot called the Disney Institute, which is the for-profit side of the university that is available to everyone outside of the company as well. So I'm, I'm going to get into these four circumstances in a moment, but just the idea that this man who never had a, a business uh, opportunity to work in the theme park environment, Van was brilliant in his ability to take ideas and bring them to life. Now, the concept of the, the four circumstances in, in Disney U, in my book, I write about one of Van's fundamental concepts, and it's about creating an organizational culture. And Van was one of the first to say that you can't just slap a new coat of paint on a dilapidated building and expect that building to all of a sudden meet building codes and stand up and, and be wonderful again. You have to look at the foundation. And there is a, a great quote from from my book that I have from from Van. He said, it took more than a good idea to bring the Disney University into existence. 
In fact, this new baby in the corporate family might have died in the delivery room had it not been for certain circumstances. And those circumstances are, quite frankly, you have to be innovative and you have to have unabashed organizational support, leadership support. You have to educate and you have to have fun. You have to entertain. So, in, again, it's innovate, organizational support, educate, entertain. And not that every organization has the exact same circumstances, but the point that, that Van was saying is that even with iconic characters like Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck, if we in the Disney University did not have organizational support and leadership support, this was this program was not going to live. If we didn't have Walt Disney banging his fist on the table saying everybody must be educated, this wasn't going to live. And if you didn't have fun while educating, people are going to get bored. They're going to tune out. So one of the things that I find very important to think about for any of your listeners, any any organizational leaders, whether it's a for profit or not for profit, is to really take a look at your organizational culture and see to what extent does it support training and education initiatives, to what extent is leadership massively involved, not just putting up posters or doing a quick little video intro to welcome to the company, but they actually get involved and they fight the battles for you so that everybody in the company has crystal clear direction as to what those values are. And that's really what Van identified in his words as the, the four circumstances that have led to almost six decades of success for the Disney University. Now, you know, you mentioned as one of the four circumstances is to educate that we provide trainings for our employees that they have these learning opportunities to understand what our organizational culture is all about. But as we most of us know, when an organization has to deal with cutting costs, the very first thing to go in most companies is employee training because we see education as being a benefit that we can provide in good times only as opposed to a prerequisite for not only keeping our employees engaged but to ensure our continued competitiveness in today's fast-changing environment. So this certainly does reflect the importance that organizational Disney has in providing those educational opportunities for their employees. But how do other organizations who don't have that as their core value ensure that they're protecting instead of cutting trading opportunities when faced with rising costs and declining revenues? Well, that's a really interesting question because kind of at the the tail end, you said if they don't have that, meaning education as a core value, quite frankly, Tanvir, I think any organization that doesn't value education will find multiple excuses for not conducting training because you and I know, looking around all the businesses around the world, I have rarely come into contact with any business owner who says, you know, Doug, I've got this massive problem. I have way too much money. I have way too many employees that are so fully engaged. I just don't know what to do. I'm pulling my hair out. Of course not. Everybody always has an excuse for why they can't, why they can't, why they can't. And I want to share with you another quote from Van. And this gives you an example or an indication of his can-do attitude, which is exactly what Walt Disney had was a can-do attitude. I mean, you don't create the multiple Academy Award winning movies and the the, the, the dynasty that Walt created by sitting back saying, I can't while wringing one's hands. And this is a, a quote that I can remember Van almost yelling to us. I mean, he was in his 60s and the rest of us were in our 30s and he had more creative uh, juice and energy in his little finger than we had in our whole bodies. And one of the things that he said constantly was money might be tight, but creativity is always free. Money might be tight, but creativity is always free. So training doesn't have to occur in a classroom. Training doesn't have to be an eight-hour, multi-projector, big event. It could be a four- or five-minute pre-shift meeting with your staff. It could be a quick meeting out in the field if you're working in a construction site, giving an employee a quick update on safety techniques before launching into the day's activities. It could be following up after a shift to do a debrief of what went well that day and a couple of things that could be improved upon. It could be daily in five-minute bursts. It could be weekly. It could be monthly. And so one of the things that I find is that if an organization at the uppermost levels of leadership truly believes in education, then you're never going to have the excuse 
of budgets or personnel. Uh, Van just called the excuse of budgets as simply an excuse. The, the value wasn't there in the first place, so the first thing we do is find excuses to cut. It's interesting that you're mentioning this quote from Van, because it reminds me of a quote you shared from Jim Cora, where he talks about how marketing is the time money you spend to get people in the door, and training, though, is the investment you make to ensure that they want to come back and to also make sure that your employees want to stay. Well, Jim would know. I mean, just to set the stage for, for your listeners and the folks with us today, is Jim was asked by Walt Disney to help start the Disney University with Van. And so despite the amazing creativity of a guy named Van, he also surrounded himself with men and women who had amazing capabilities. And Jim had a 43-year career at the park. He retired as the chairman of Disney International. He was instrumental in starting Tokyo Disneyland, uh, Disneyland Paris, Hong Kong Disney. He really took the reins after Walt passed and after Van was out of the picture and perpetuated those four circumstances that we already talked about. One of the challenges that I think a lot of organizations are struggling with is that when they achieve a certain level of success, their organizations and their leaders begin to narrow or limit their focus on things that serve to maintain that status quo, and they begin to lose touch with the values that guided and drove their actions to succeed in the first place. And that's why you write about how we need to find that balance of reinforcing what we're known for against what we stand for. Or I think you refer to it as being a balance between the mind and the heart, between things and values. Yes, it's capturing hearts and minds. And <clears throat> all too often I see in organizations where they, they put up, as I alluded to earlier, posters or they'll have wonderful motivational speeches by a leader or an executive, but in the daily interaction, you don't see that coming to life. And so in the daily interactions, if what is written on posters, for example, our human resources are our most important resource, but in daily interactions, employees feel belittled or ridiculed, that's what they're going to believe. And so one of the things that Van ensured at Disney University was that it wasn't a standalone operation. It's kind of like quality control. Quality control is not a department. If it's a department in a factory, then you're in trouble. Quality control has to be a philosophy that permeates every aspect of any organization, as with training, as with guest service. So as an example, when we would have new hire orientation at Disney University when I was in charge of training. One of the things that we talked about was cleanliness and how everybody needs to know that our customer base truly values a clean environment. Your uniforms are clean, the environment is clean, the bathrooms are spotless, and we would show pictures, for example, of Walt Disney picking up trash. We would have videos, we'd have discussions, but really this was still in a training environment. So that's still at the head level. Now to get to the heart level, that emotional level, we would take our new hire employees into the park at Disneyland or Disney World for about an hour of, a, of an onstage tour, we called it. So it's really walking through the property during business hours. So you might have 80 or 90,000 people in the park. And our primary goal during this time, Tanvir, was for our new hires to see multiple examples of non-custodial personnel. So people that don't have buckets and brooms in their hands, for example, executives walking to or from meetings or employees, cast members going to or from a break, bending over and picking up a piece of trash. These obviously are not custodians, but when my new hires would see that, now all of a sudden it's captured not only in their heads from the earlier exposure in the Disney University, but now their heart. They're saying, wow, these folks really do walk the talk. I buy in. And interestingly enough, that doesn't ever become an issue anymore. People buy in, you move forward. But all too often I see just the opposite, where you've talked a blue streak about cleanliness and then the equivalent of me taking my new hires out into the park. And if they had seen many examples of executives stomping on a piece of trash and ignoring it, all that education is out the window. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned the lessons the new hires get, because one of the ones that also stood out for me and it really resonated with me was how new employees are taught that it's the Disney parks that are the star and everything else plays a supporting role. 
And I like this point because it drives home the idea that if we focus solely on how to retain the key talent in an organization, we end up making them the focus of our efforts. And subsequently, we can easily overlook how to engage, empower, and even stretch the core competencies of our other employees so they can become valued contributors to our shared purpose. And I also like it because by communicating and exemplifying that our shared purpose is the real star of the organization where we see executives actually being willing to pick up the trash because cleanliness is a part of our shared purpose in creating that kind of an environment that people feel welcome. It's a happy place for people to come and have a pleasant memory with their families. It does become easier for employees to care and feel invested in what they do because they can see and understand how the collective efforts of all of us, not just the frontline employees, but all the way up to management, are being done to serve making our shared purpose a reality. You know, you mentioned the from the frontline employees all the way to the executive level, and, and I have to underscore that because I was in the Disney University at Disneyland, so my my audience would be anywhere from 16 years of age to 70 years of age, from new hire employees through middle and upper level management. The culture at the Disneyland or, or Magic Kingdom and Disney World is very um, show-oriented and very uh, Walt Disney-centric. I mean, it's all about his, his theme parks. But I was also in charge of training at Disney Studios, which is the headquarters. And that's a totally different culture. You have people that, that are high-powered Hollywood executives who frankly are more focused on their little niche, their little piece of the world. And Tanvir, one of the things that I really appreciated in my career at Disney and, and getting back to Van's four circumstances, and I, I mentioned having the organization support is so vitally important, is when I'd be giving a, a leadership seminar to a bunch of grizzled Hollywood veterans at Disney Studios, you know, sometimes they come into a training room and their arms are folded and their minds are shut and they're kind of thinking, oh, what is this? But then all of a sudden when the chairman of Disney Studios walks in the room and he talks about how they went to all of this effort to bring Johnny Depp on board to create the Pirates of the Caribbean uh, movie and he wants to share with the team how we can all work better together to improve scripts. And then if we involve the marketing people or the production team earlier on in kind of like a concurrent engineering mindset, perhaps we can create scripts that are even better, not only for the movie, but for after the movie comes out. And now we have merchandise to sell. And at the end of all this, you've got this synergy and you've got a better product. You're making more money and you've got. In my, in my training room now, I have 10 to 15 senior executives who are absolutely glued to what this guy is saying. So that's the point, is that the training was important, and it was backed up by senior level executives at every stage of this production process. And it just coincidentally, the guy who was the chairman of Disney uh, Studios started out as a monorail operator at Disneyland, and he personally remembers Van himself leading many training programs, even though Van was the professor emeritus and should be above and beyond that. Heck no, he rolled up his sleeves and got the job done. It's a great example because I know in your book you were talking about how, and this is something that a lot of organizations struggle with, is the uh, existence of organizational silos. And you point out how it's not about us trying to completely remove them, but to find a way to use that to create that creative friction. Because like you said, one of the four circumstances is that we have to show organizational support that management is involved in the process and cares. So by having marketing and production together, it's no longer about them focusing on it from their vantage point, but they're almost collaborating in terms of bringing movies like Pirates of the Caribbean to life, but attacking it from their different aspects on how they can really make this a success not just in the theaters, but also in terms of creating merchandise and other outlets for them to benefit from creating this new product line. Yeah, and it's really, a, a there are so many different ways in which to do this, and certainly we're talking about the Disney model uh, right now, but I see plenty of organizations around the world that are the embodiment of some of these concepts, and one of the most important things is, 
for leaders at whatever level to get out and touch the customer and their employees to get put their finger on the pulse of the organization and I challenge my clients constantly to get out and do something that Walt Disney did that Van France did and all these executives and we called it walk the park get out and walk the park so metaphorically anybody can do that whether you are a surgeon in a hospital whether you are an owner of a fast food restaurant it doesn't matter if you have excuses for not walking the park then you're in the wrong place and I challenge executives all the time if Walt Disney could get out and pick up trash if he could ride on the rides if he could engage with customers and with employees on a regular basis meaning weekly What's your excuse for not doing that? Right. You know, I love the fact that you're bringing up that point about how leaders need to make that time in their day to walk the park or walk the floor in their organization. Because it reminds me of this great story you share of one of those times where, and I remember you, you writing your book how Walt would do that, I think, every morning. He would walk the park, and he wasn't necessarily walking it in terms of being, well, I'm the owner of this park, as it is. He was walking it in terms of being a visitor, and times even going onto his knees so he can see the perspective as a child. What would the child see as the viewpoint of the different buildings in his park? But there is one example, in particular, one story I really love of when he visited with a gondola operator, both to watch to see how he gives his presentations and also what he saw as potential ways to improve how that ride could operate. I'd love for you to share it with my listeners because I really found that story very informative and entertaining as well. Well, certainly, Tanvir, one of the, the other phrases we used at Disney a lot is to say, let's keep plussing the show, plussing meaning improving, so plus versus minus. So Walt would say we have to keep plussing the show because if we ever lose our guests, it will take 10 years to get them back. So he was the person who would lead the charge in plussing the show as a role model. So, for example, as you say, he would walk the park not only during business hours, but he would also descend from his apartment on Main Street and at Disneyland, and he would come down at 1, 2, 3 in the morning to interact with the maintenance or custodial cast members who are working on graveyard shift and ask them questions. So the, the story that you're referring to is one of the gondola operators on the Skyway who at the time was about 18, 19 years of age was busy loading and unloading gondolas and it was in the winter season so it wasn't really busy. And at one point he looked over his shoulder and he saw Walt sitting on a bench kind of in the back behind the loading area and he thought, uh oh, there's the boss. and He'd heard of these opportunities where Walt would suddenly appear and then he start asking questions. And so he kind of took a gulp and thought, okay, there's the big boss. And Walt said, hey, Tom, you have a minute. I see that you know there's a, a little lag in, in guests on the gondolas. And he said, well, sure, Walt. <laughs> Expect him to say, no, I don't have any time. He said, sure. And Walt said, you know, you run this Skyway every day. Thousands of guests on and off the gondolas. We're thinking about improving this. We're thinking about plussing the show for the Skyway. And since you run this every day, you know better than anybody in the organization what works and what doesn't. So, Tom, what do you think we should do to improve, to plus the show for the Skyway? And Tom said, well, Walt, you know, when I load and unload guests, one of the most common problems I have is they bump their heads on the roof. It's not high enough. People get on or get off, and they're not busy looking at their heads are looking at where their feet are and I'm constantly apologizing because they're bumping their heads on the little overhang. I think we should raise the roof on each gondola. And Walt thanked him, got on the gondola and bumped his head. <laughs> but the key point here, Tanvir, is that in the ensuing months when that attraction was improved, this feedback was taken into account and they did, the engineers did indeed raise that overhang that roof on each gondola on the ride. You know, I love this story because it brings the important point that how often we overlook how valuable the insights and experience of our employees are because they see firsthand the gaps in what we're doing and what incremental and at times significant changes we should be making that can help us elevate our offerings so that we're not just competing or treading water, but that we can now rise above. And like you said, using the Disney phrase, we're plussing our show. 
And I also love how the story of Walt reminds us of how the ability to transform the vision we have for our organization into reality is really dependent on the collective efforts of all of our employees and being willing to hear and understand what they see as the obstacles that are preventing us from achieving that goal. And that's really the key because if it's, if it's dependent on a policy or dependent on a supervisor always writing employees, then it's not a collective approach. But just getting back to that example of picking up trash, can you imagine if you had to rely on a relatively small number of custodians to keep Disneyland or Disney World clean with the hundreds of thousands of guests? That's an impossible task. But now when you have thousands of cast members going to and from breaks, going to and from their shift, looking with a keen eye to picking up trash, all of a sudden you have that multiplier effect that can be found in any part of the organization if people buy in. This is reminding me of another story that you share in your book of a janitor named Timothy and how one day when he was sweeping the grounds, he heard this boy crying and he looks over and he sees that the boy's crying because he had dropped his bag of popcorn and the dad is, you know, basically chastising the boy for being careless and dropping it. And Timothy walks over to the boy and he kneels down to his eye level and tells the boy he's sorry about the popcorn and that Mickey Mouse had saw that the boy had dropped the popcorn and knew he must be sad. And so Mickey Mouse wanted this boy to have this new bag of popcorn, at which point Timothy pulls a new bag of popcorn from behind his back to give to the boy. And I love this story because it illustrates something that I think more organizations need to foster, and that is a culture of shared accountability, where we're showing people that our focus is not on assigning blame when things go wrong, but on giving our employees the authority to identify how we can resolve situations like this because they have a sense of shared ownership in our collective efforts. In Timothy's case, he's not looking at this example of the mess of popcorn saying, okay, well, I have to sweep that area after the boy and the dad leaves. He's thinking, my goal here is to help create the happiest place on earth. And clearly at this moment, the father and the son are not living in that kind of an environment. So what can I do? And he didn't have to go ask his supervisor, would it be okay if I do this? He felt like he had the authority to resolve that situation and live up to their shared purpose, that vision of creating that happiest place on earth. Yeah, and <clears throat> the key here is that every cast member knew that they were empowered to solve the most commonly occurring problems. And this is really going to be a decision by any company owner or any team of leaders of any organization, is not every day is going to go perfectly well. We talked about it at Disney. When things don't go according to script, like in a movie, they don't go according to script because this is a live production every day. Things are going to go sideways. How do we resolve those problems? And one of the fundamentals of this concept of entertainment that, that Van would talk about and many of the leaders would talk about is kind of found in, in this other quote that I have in the book is, is this, is the business we're in, if we can't have fun, how could we expect the public to have fun? So whether you're a sweeper or a security officer or whatever, if you see that child crying and that popcorn is spilled, you've been trained to not only approach that child, but to kneel down and get on his or her eye level. And as soon as the employee would kneel down to this next to this child, the child stops screaming. So there's win number one. And then when you pull out this free box of popcorn and say, hey, buddy, do you mind if, if I give you this free box of popcorn because Mickey wants you to have it, all of a sudden the kid is beaming, as are his or her parents, as are 14 or 15 other guests. And so when you think about the price of a box of popcorn, maybe it's 25 cents, and maybe it costs the guests $4. The margins on popcorn are pretty, pretty darn good. But the point is this, the return on investment is multiple times higher than that. I have 5, 10, 15, 20 guests who are thrilled. They're going to talk more about that box of popcorn example than the multi-million dollar ride system that kept them safe on Space Mountain. And I have a cast member, I have an employee, minimum wage employee who is absolutely thrilled beyond belief. He or she is now going to be going through the park during their daily job, but they're going to be looking for other opportunities to turn around what could be a negative into a positive, not only for the guest, 
but also for himself or herself. And all too often, I see leaders and owners who will say, yes, empowerment is a good thing, but then they draw the line in the sand and they handcuff their employees who then cannot solve the most mundane problems. For example, I'm sure that you've experienced this. When I go to a restaurant and maybe I have a two-for-one coupon, and at the end of the meal, I give that two-for-one coupon to the employee, and they say, oh, I'm so sorry, the coupon just expired five seconds ago. Well, how silly is it that we would have to have a discussion about that? Just take care of the problem. I'm not suggesting that throwing free things and comping customers is the all-ending answer. In fact, if you have to comp or give away too much stuff, it's an indication of much deeper, more onerous operational challenges. But I see too many examples of frontline, mid-level, even senior managers not being able to take care of things that at their level should be no-brainer. Right. And you know, I'm actually glad that you brought up the idea that we need to recognize the fact that things will go wrong. Because whenever we do talk about a storied organization like Disney or other thriving organizations like Zappos or Southwest Airlines, it's easy for us to focus on their successes and their triumphs in the face of today's economic challenges. But in your book, you also share a time when things weren't going so well at Disney, when employee morale was extremely low, and they were experiencing a high turnover rate that left them scrambling to try to find replacements. But of course, as we see now, that Disney has managed to overcome that challenge that many organizations are currently struggling with today, and that they're now basically become this entertainment juggernaut that keeps growing and evolving. So how did Disney overcome this dark period in history? How did they get their employees back on board and committed to that shared purpose after taking this hard stumble? Well, you know, it's interesting. When, when Disney World opened in 1971, Magic Kingdom, You've got the, any kind of a grand opening for any organization is going to be met with two things, uh, amazing excitement and then crashing and burning afterwards. It's, it's kind of like the honeymoon, right? Once the honeymoon's over and you're grinding it out in your daily life, it's not nearly as fun or sexy, but you have to make it fun and sexy despite that eventual crash of, of anybody after this momentous occasion. And really, this is, I think, indicative of any organization, but it, it reinforces the four circumstances that we've already talked about, is that Disney World, one of the things that the director of the university, and the director of the university, coincidentally, was the man that we've already talked about who worked with Walt to improve the ride on those gondolas when he was a teenager. He aspired to becoming the director of all Disney universities, a guy named Tom Eastman, wonderful man. And he talked about how the turnover rate, the employee uh, abandonment rate at Disney World had gone from what the, the industry norm would be around 55%, and it had spiked to close to 80%, 83%, I think it was. So the, the turnover rate was really high, and the environment wasn't as fun as it really should have been. So to make a long story short, Tom and the Disney University realized they could not drive the improvement alone. It had to be, as we've said before, a collective operation with people in operations, people in engineering, the whole team. And what was amazing is when he brought this up to the leadership of the company, and at the time the president of outdoor entertainment was a guy named Dick Nunes, Dick was a devotee of the university. Dick was Van Francis' very first hire. So Dick knew the importance of leadership, leading the charge, and not being afraid to roll up their sleeves. So he looked at the symbolic nature of the Cinderella Castle in the middle of the Magic Kingdom. He said, the Cinderella Castle is our symbol of the organization. How many of our vice presidents of operations have even visited the Cinderella Castle? So to make a long story short, this guy Dick Nunes and Tom Eastman decided to have a series of meetings every single week in Cinderella Castle. And this was not an opulent room. This was actually a room that was left over from the construction days. And the point is, is that on a weekly basis, the senior vice presidents of every division would ascend multiple levels of stairs or go up a rickety old construction elevator to the top of Cinderella Castle from which they could see their metaphorical kingdom. And they were talking about the challenges that they had with overcoming employee morale problems. And they 
needed to get back out and connect with their constituents. And through a number of efforts to conduct employee surveys and to go out and walk the park as Walt had done, in a, in a relatively short amount of time, that ridiculously high turnover rate of 80 plus percent dropped to about 28 percent. And it took, them, it took them a couple of years to really work on this. So two years' time, they had a, about a 66% relative reduction in turnover, which is amazing if you think about how much it costs to hire and train qualified personnel. If you can reduce their turnover by that much of a percentage, you've more than paid for the efforts. But the key is every organization has something that symbolizes what they're all about. And does ownership, does leadership leverage that to make sure that they stay engaged with their employees as well as their customers? This kind of exemplifies the common theme running through our whole discussion today about how our organizational values that we use to define and exemplify why we do what we do has to exist not just in those moments when we are doing our jobs, but it should really exist as a living embodiment of everything we do, both within the walls of our organization and outside. And there is a great example you share referring to the community outreach work that Disney employees volunteered to do and how when they approached it, they took those organizational values to how they operated because they saw that our values shouldn't just guide our actions and our words and our efforts inside the organization. It should guide everything we do, even outside, because this is the reason why we do what we do, and the work we're doing outside in the community is a reflection of that. You're right. In fact, it's an interesting story in, in the Disney University book. The mayor of San Francisco, a man named Art Agnos, actually called the Disney University asking for help with the homeless problem in San Francisco. Go figure. Is there a connection between creating the happiest place on earth and improving conditions for the homeless? And I met with Art just last week in San Francisco. In fact, he and I are going to be doing a presentation at the Walt Disney Family Museum, which is a museum in San Francisco started by Walt's daughter, Diane Disney, who is vibrant, healthy at 80 years of age. You'd, you'd swear you're talking to Walt because of the enthusiasm with which she talks about this museum. But getting back to this Art Agno story, he had gone to Disneyland many times with his family, and he saw how masses of people were moved through lines in a respectful fashion, how people smiled, how the property was clean, and he said every human being deserves to be respected and to be exposed to a clean, respectful environment. And so he called the university, he called the, the leadership at the studios, and they said, absolutely, Mayor Agnos, we're happy to help you out. So a couple of the Disney uh, you colleagues of mine went up to San Francisco, walked through the city with Mayor Agnos, and ultimately gave some suggestions on how you can treat the homeless with even more respect than you're doing now. So according to Mayor Agnos, he said, we spiffed up the homeless shelters. We made sure that we addressed our, our homeless with, with direct eye contact and a smile. And yes, sometimes it might feel kind of strange to, to pat somebody on the back who doesn't smell as nice as you and they're not as clean as you, but we can do that. And he said that the, the fundamental values that are present at Disneyland can be found anywhere. And it was so cool to hear him talk about the enthusiasm with which his staff uh, engaged the homeless after the Disney University training team left. So really, Tanvir, there is no reason why any of these four circumstances we've talked about or the fundamentals that it creates the happiest place on earth at Disneyland or Disney World can't be had anywhere. Absolutely. I mean, whenever we look at some of these organizations that we admire and respect, the values that they have, whether it's Disney or Southwest Airlines, the, their values are pretty much ones that I think most organizations, to some degree, ascribe to or want to say that's what they represent. And I think the difference really is more in the application of how do they embodify those values. And so it becomes really more a connection between not just like you said, putting values up on posters and sticking it around, but that we're exemplifying it in everything we do from the highest levels of management right down to the frontline employees. We all have that level of care and concern of ensuring that we embodify 
what it is that our organization represents and what we're about. Yes, and you know, getting back to the Mayor Agnos story, I remember talking to one of the Disney University trainers that met with him, and she said after we spent the whole day with Mayor Agnos, she knew without a doubt that the initiatives that the Disney University was sharing with him and his staff were absolutely going to work. And, and I said, why did you know that? And she said, just like Walt Disney, the mayor walked the city with us and he knew the names of all the homeless in the shelters. He knew the names of all the staff, whether they be paid or volunteer. Even better, upon return to this opulent city hall building, and we're ascending these marble steps going to Mayor Agnos' office. At the end of this day, Mayor Agnos bent over and picked up a piece of trash on the steps of City Hall. She said, at that moment, I knew that he indeed was walking the talk and that this project that we were uh, embarking on with him would have legs. You know, there's just so many great stories you share and insights. And what I especially like is how the message in your book is really reflecting how the efforts and approaches used by Disney are not unique. They're not special. These are things that any organization can achieve. They just have to demonstrate that intent and that desire to demonstrate a commitment to connecting what matters to our employees with what matters to our organization so that we can feel that sense of connectedness and ownership in our collective efforts. Yeah, and it's a matter of being willing and able to challenge complacency. We touched upon this earlier, and I think we could just spend a, a couple more moments, and, and I know that we're getting toward the end of our time. But in 1962, Van France sent a memo to Walt Disney, and he was talking about how things were not quite as good as they had been in the past. So we've already talked about Disney World in the early 70s, but Disneyland also fell on some times where morale was a little bit low, and Van took a look, walked the park, and realized things need to be improved. And he had the horsepower, he had the guts to send a memo to Walt saying, you know what, we're not quite the, the, the great organization we think we are. And I want to share with you and your listeners a portion of this memo that he sent, which I think truly captures both his, his creativity, but also the guts that he had to, to call it like he saw it. So it, it kind of goes, there's a, a number of pages, but the, the key point is this, quote, the trouble with people is we get hardening of the mental arteries cirrhosis of the enthusiasm, and arthritis of the imagination. I mean, is that a cool way to say we're kind of tanking right now, Walt, we got to get, we got to get back together? And every organization out there needs the equivalent of a Van France. Every leader, every business owner, every supervisor needs a counterpart who is going to bring to her or him the brutal honesty that in some cases isn't so fun to listen to. But as soon as we surround ourselves with yes men and yes women who don't give us the honest, sometimes bitter feedback, our days are numbered. Absolutely. And I love that we're capping off this conversation with this wonderful quote from Van, since it was his four circumstances that have helped to define those organizational values that have helped Disney to be so successful over the last several decades. You know, Doug, every time we have a chance to connect and talk about the Disney University and the way they approach empowering employees and training them to connect what their values and what the organization is about with what they do, I always find it very insightful and enlightening. And I'm just really grateful you took the time to share some of your insights and experiences and great stories with my listeners. Well, I, I appreciate this very much, Tanvir, and I, in, in, in due respect to Walt Disney, I'd like to, to wrap up my piece with a quote from him that really does embody the, the four circumstances we talked about, and especially the educate and entertain portion. And so here's something to, to, to wrap it up with a quote from Walt Disney, quote, when the subject permits, we let fly with all the satire and gags at our command. Laughter is no enemy to learning. And that's what it's all about. Even if you're dealing with PhD scientists in a laboratory, you can educate and entertain at the same time, Tanvir. Absolutely, Doug. I completely agree with you. And hopefully following our conversation today, people will see and appreciate the wisdom in Walt's words. Thank you so much, Doug. Like I said, I really enjoy every chance I get to sit down and talk with you. It's really been a pleasure. 
Thanks for the opportunity. Appreciate it. I've been talking with Doug Lip about his book, Disney U, How Disney University Develops the World's Most Engaged, Loyal, and Customer-Centric Employees. To learn more about Doug and his book, visit the webpage for this episode at tavernasir.com. And that concludes this episode of Leadership Biz Cafe. I hope you enjoyed this conversation, and as always, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what we discussed in this episode, as well as what topics you'd like to hear in future episodes of this show. You can do this by leaving a comment on this episode's webpage, or by filling out the contact form at tavernasir.com. And if you found my show on iTunes, please be sure to join other listeners in rating this show. Until next time, this is Tavernasir. Thanks everyone for listening.